close your blinds and light a candle with me. I'm Geshe Six, and I welcome you to Third Eye. Last time, we learned that we had no friends and executed the messenger for this. Our Third Eye has also stopped working for some mysterious reason. At last, we get around to looking after poor Maribel. The eye drops have not been kind to her, yet it seems she is about to recover. Standing upright again, we start getting to know each other. Maribel tells us that she is lost in this forest. I'm sure the same applies to us after our sudden flight from the mansion. Now Koishi learns of what ailed her new acquaintance. We as onlookers already knew about the eye drops, of course. Koishi explains what they are and doesn't make them sound nearly as special as they are. Maribel, however, understands. I can see things I shouldn't, she says. Well, these two girls have something in common now. That could be fortunate. Finally, we are making introductions. Neither have we told anyone our name before, nor have we learned another's. It must be a completely new experience for Koishi. I'm Mary. Mulberry Harn. Huh, in a very thick Japanese accent, Maribel could turn into Mulberry, I guess. The fact that she told it to us is a good sign. Remember, all the friends who didn't turned out to be figments of our imagination. With that, we team up in search of Maribel's group. It's the smart thing to do when nobody knows the area. Music can now be heard again. It's in a range of Cinderella Cage, Kagome Kagome. It's a very positive sounding one, not nearly as dramatic as the original. The next screen holds an item, a cassette of the kind that has died out near the end of the 90s. Koishi as well seems to be too young to recognize what it is. That or yokai are just too averse to learning about human society. Maribel is luckily experienced enough to teach Koishi about the object, who also doesn't know what recording is supposed to be. It reminds me of that one note we found, which claimed that children often don't see a need for record keeping. Didn't Koishi already encounter a recorder? Yeah, the boombox that we gave to Kyoko to overcome her shyness. There was also Flandre's gramophone as a sort of antique record player. Hmm, there seems to be a running theme there. Maribel informs us that right now the cassette tape is useless, we first need a device to put it into. The blonde girl has a phonograph, but that's the wrong format. Regrettable. Perhaps along our travels we will discover one that fits. For now, we can at least pocket the item. The label reads Ideas Planet. Sounds somewhat intellectual and esoteric at the same time. Maybe it's a demanding audiobook or something. The current area, as well as the music, make it likely this chapter is referencing Imperishable Night. Ideally, we'll run into Moko, who is known to help those that have gone lost. Another tape on the ground. Had the previous been the only one, it could have been a coincidence, now it's a pattern. Koishi may often be a little naive, but she too connected those dots. Has someone deliberately strewn tapes along this forest? Renko's name gets dropped, upon which we receive a callback to the info about nominalization. Renko translates to Lotus, and that is strange for Koishi. I can understand her. Japanese naming is definitely peculiar, particularly for Westerners. The best example I can think of is the name Momoshiro men can have. It means white peach. 
Imagine if a muscle-bound dude approached you and then went, Hello, I'm a white peach. Of course, if you grow up in that culture, you won't see the weirdness. But Koishi does not seem to be at that point. She can't help but take everything literally. We proceed to tell Maribel about the playtime with friends we might not have ever truly experienced. She became dumb. I think Cherno has always been dumb, Koishi. And now you are starting to sound like a serial killer. Koishi does not know the importance of selective reporting. There's such a thing as too much information. Maribel replies exactly how most people would. She closes the conversation with a nervous, is that so? The tape we picked up before any of that is titled Japanese Iconic Food, and it's revealed that it's specifically to Renko's liking. The next item we stumble upon is different from the tapes, but of a similar color and sleekness. After a bit of confusion, Maribel reveals that this is in fact a cassette tape player. What a tease this game can be, giving us not one but two tapes before this useful tool. We stuff it in our luggage, which is also our hat I guess, and learn that it was originally Maribel's. She allows us its usage for the time being. The cassettes are hopefully still functional after being marooned in the wilderness. Let's get to some listening. That was Ideas Planet, gentle but also a little futuristic. <laughs> Japanese iconic food turned out to be more simplistic. It was an exotic flute that I could picture a snake charmer would use. Maribel warns us here that if we stray too far, Renko's trail might grow cold. This spot is indeed a dead end. Maybe passage will be possible once we complete other objectives. We had not gone west over here before. That leads to an old acquaintance, Tay. The rabbit girl has canonical clothes and animal features this time. We greet her cordially, but in return are only met with confusion and timidness. Maybe Tay's lagomorphic brain is a little sluggish, so we try to remind her of the time near the playground. It does not work. Koishi's behavior only comes off as bizarre, even somewhat threatening. What else can we do but give it a second try? As that one goes no better, Maribel also starts doubting the existence of Koishi's and Tei's friendship. Keep in mind here, there's a big difference between what our protagonist believes and we as onlookers. We already have the suspicion that the Tei Koishi got to know was a creation of her own dreams. Koishi, however, still refuses to consider that. At least this taste starts being more helpful now. She offers to either get us out of the bamboo forest or towards A and T, yet we are not interested. What's really grabbing Koishi's attention is something she spots in the distance. We are blocking the view right now, but upon entering the area, you could tell that Tay had exchanged an existing sign with one that points the other way. The exit is supposedly not to the east anymore, but to the west. Since forests don't tend to magically change their layout, I think that rabbit scoundrel is trying to trick people. Upon questioning, Tay says there's nothing over there, 
Nothing in parentheses. That's either a very weak lie, or something I can't quite claim to understand. Tay goes on that some people yearn for and seek this nothingness, but stays vague about it. Koji does not count among those seeking individuals, as she's supposedly empty. What could that mean? Speaking to Tay past this only leads to her being rude. If anything, her dream self had the accurate personality. As we enter the next screen, Maribel descends into pessimism. We haven't found Renko, and our new friend is close to losing the last of her motivation. It's now up to Koishi to shout for this girl, named after a lotus. Maribel's throat is too sore for her to do it herself. I bet her feet are also cold and her nose is stuffy and real estate prices are too high. The attempt itself was also unsuccessful, but I think we have another ace up our sleeve. It's not the defective third eye. How about we place something to Renko's liking at this very spot? We are then educated that the strange flute is called a caramella. I was wrong about this being used by snake charmers. It's an instrument originating from Portugal. This might have been the first puzzle where we actively had to use an object. Our reward is luring the missing Renko to us. The ceiling club is back together now and the two friends are catching up to speed. In fact, their conversation is going ahead so fast that little Koishi almost seems excluded. I'm still waiting for introductions, or at least a who is this from Renko, but nothing so far. It's like we're thin air for our newcomer. She thought it was a river ramen stand. Caramelas are apparently used to advertise ramen. Seems really random to use a foreign instrument for that, but don't forget, the Portuguese had a lot of influence on Japan during the Age of Discovery. Renko has put on a very baffled expression. Not only is she refusing to greet us, I have to ask if there's something on our face. Still, I'm looking forward to seeing how our new party member can support us. Not in regards to Tay, though, she is still as grumpy as ever. I wonder if her messing with the exit sign is part of her job description, or if she's sabotaging the efforts of the a and crew. All while we're exploring, there's a dark fog in the air, a little hard to see perhaps. It might or might not be part of the normal weather around these parts, but it's definitely making the atmosphere more gloomy. Right here is the place that was previously a dead end. It's also where Renko questions Maribel's well-being. If there's anyone acting peculiar, I'd say it's Renko herself. We are instantly brought to a new area. The scenery is of course indistinguishable, but since there is another tape on the ground, we can't have been here before. Maribel complains that she is tired, so there must have been a substantial trek that the game skipped for us. She also dropped a cassette somewhere with her butterfingers. Is it the one two feet away from you? Perhaps not. The missing tape is blank. That applies to none of the two we have so far, nor is there a guarantee this would be the one in question. We'll have to search until we find the correct one. What composition is stored on here? Unwelcome to the jungle. They have no fun nor games there, I guess. Could it be a rock song? No, it's smooth jazz, and I think the arrangement is based on Nitori's theme, Candid Friend. Maribel makes some ominous predictions there, 
that this forest stirs our emotions, breaks our heart, and may even kill us. I didn't know she had such an edgy side. Just to be safe, we should get a move on. Now here's someone or something I didn't expect to see. This Jizo statue has the exact same accessories as Narumi Yatadera. Similar to the snowman of the previous chapter, it is sentient, but that's a lot less out of place since Narumi is a Jizo. We can assume this must be her. Immediately the statue starts treating us like a lost child, questioning the sensibility of our plans as we state them. We learn that she looks after passing travelers, and the nothingness that Tay mentioned gets hinted at again. Maybe that is not part of a trick, but something dangerous we must watch out for. Despite the stern warning, we have no choice but to proceed, and thus we meet Reisen Udongi in Inaba. The moon rabbit is known to be more mature than her earthen colleague. She also comes across as a lot more polite in our greeting. Koishi must have thought to have lost a friend when she encountered the real Tei. Maybe Reisen will be a better substitute. Let's not jump ahead too far though. We are asked whether we want to leave the bamboo forest. To our surprise, Koishi declines. She is only concerned with getting Renko and Maribel home. Koishi fled to here in a haste, but maybe this is where she truly belongs, away from the mansion as well as the guilt from the attack on her sister. The next question is a lot stranger. Are we a ghost? I think I know what that is about. Koishi is of course not an undead but her unconscious movement makes it difficult for a lot of people to perceive her. To those who can't see her, Koishi's actions could be mistaken for a haunting, thus a ghost. In light of this, we are offered medicine. Reisen doesn't make any, she's only a dealer. Oh my, I expect the next question to be, you're not a cop, are you? Erin gets hinted at as the pharmacist. Maybe we'll get a chance to meet the doctor. For now, Reisen has neither more words nor drugs to share. With that, we'll take a break for today, next to a fear-frozen Tay. I'm Geshidi6, and I will see you again soon. If you are brave enough, that is.